What is up, my friends? Welcome to another video. In this video, we are gonna continue this story about and uh, this probing of a global currency, a global currency initiative, one world currency, right? Whatever you wanna call it. And this is all part of the global banking elite, the Illuminati, the uh, cabal, uh, whatever you wanna call it, right? Who cares? It doesn't matter the name. I think people get so caught up in names. Um, so we are going to uncover something that I actually had no clue about until very recently. Otherwise, I would've incorporated it into other videos. But the beauty of always learning, always diving down new rabbit holes is you learn more stuff, right? And I'm not one to get too glued to my ideals or beliefs, and I am very open to changing them. If better information is presented to me, it conflicts with old stuff. Uh, that's one of the hardest and funnest things I think about being human. Okay, so special drawing rights, SDR. We're gonna take it back to 1969 on the back end of the Bretton Woods model that was ready to fail and fall apart. We had a, uh, a group of people get together and they created the uh, SDR, which is essentially a bucket of national currencies, a basket, a bucket, whatever you wanna call it. And it was built by the IMF. And I wanna remind you that once again, the IMF is unaccountable to to anyone, okay? They do not take orders from anyone. It is filled with uh, unelected central bank chiefs and um, just a consortium of bankers from uh, various countries. A lot of these cannot be audited. Fits very much in alignment with the uh, with the Fed, but I think it's really, really interesting. Some really interesting changes that we'll get into is the fact that uh, the Chinese Yuan was brought in in 2016, and there was just recent news, because the thing I wanna know about is like, is this a dead thing? Is this a dead property because we got the IMF coming over here and talking about this dual currency system with this digital currency. So what is the SDR? And I found some really interesting stuff. There's a lot of people really talking about this back in 2016, Jim Edwards being a big one right around when he launched his gold book. But there was supposedly something that was supposed to happen in 2018, which maybe what they were talking about was the 1988 Economist article, right? It was uh, October 2018 was the date on the coin. Maybe that was the date when they were supposed to flip the switch. Maybe this was something that was supposed to be rolled out, but just didn't because cryptocurrency took off. Uh, maybe cryptocurrency was the uh, was the thing that was going to come in and replace everything. Somehow, maybe they're going to still work with the SDR and turn this digital and make this thing work still because it's not a dead project. It's still being talked about to this very moment. And in fact, I'll show you some recent news about it. Anyways, it, there's a lot of really interesting pieces on this. Here's in case you're wondering on the IMF directly. Here it is. And here is today's. So you can get a quick look at that. Here's the breakdown, exchange rates, US dollar equivalency, and then the total. Uh, one SDR in US dollars, about $1.39. Yeah, pretty pretty interesting. I, I was brand new to all this. Okay, so let's look at some recent news um, on this, and then we're gonna dive into a related organization. We're gonna dive into crypto that's working with this, and then we're gonna jump into where I believe uh, things are kind of going, okay? Okay, so waiting on global renminbi. This is essentially talking about, okay, 2008 financial crisis. That was also the year that IMF announced the renminbi would become one of the currencies that underpinned its own reserve asset, the special drawing right. Now, what's interesting to me about this is the US and really the IMF, these federal players that are just trickled throughout are just kind of writing their own rules with this stuff. You know, we, we recently found out that it's estimated $29 trillion in a global bailout. It spanned far outside the reach of the United States after the 2000, let's just call it 2007 to 2009 crisis. Supposedly during that same time, the SDR was created and the SDR has given this out to banks as well. So I think a lot of the ways that they're getting the SDR out is through quantitative easing. So quantitative easing is they're giving a cash and Injection to the banks essentially uh, for the banks to then do something with it. And I think that's actually still occurring even to this very minute. And so SDR seems to be the way that they're able to do this at some degree. I, I don't know exactly, but I've been hearing different things and, and I want to uh, research this more and I'll bring more information to you. But at this point, I know that SDR is a way that they are dispersing this QE, okay? So I didn't read this article, but um, this was just recently written. It doesn't have the date on it, but it was just this month. This was rolled out just this month. So there's still talk about this. Yeah, there it is, 319. That proves that it's still relevant because I thought, wow, maybe this is like just a dead project that nobody's nobody's really doing anything with. Um, but there's actually tie-ins with what was called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was a 1996 creation, didn't really do anything um, for a while. And then it got kind of rolled into another organization, I believe in 2015. Where's my notes on that? Uh, here we go. Yes. In 2015, it merged. So let's, let's talk about 
about this in just a second here. Okay, the main objectives of the SCO are to strengthen uh, relationships among member states, promote cooperation in political affairs, economics, trade, and scientific, technical, uh, cultural, and educational spheres, as well as in energy, transportation, tourism. So essentially, it's just a way for countries to coordinate together. What I find interesting about this, and this will become more important later, is China and Russia were actually the two founding countries, and they got these other countries involved. China and Russia works fairly closely together on the one on the Silk Road Initiative, One Belt Silk Road Initiative, whatever you want to call it. They work pretty closely together. I, I think that's concerning for a lot of people because it makes people in the U.S. feel like China and Russia, which are two big superpowers, are doing things out there without anyone knowing about it and kind of do, making their own plans, right? And I think to a degree that's kind of true. But let's look at a news piece. Why the Shanghai Cooperation, why the Shanghai Cooperation Organization fails, the SCO now looks more like the G7 than an effective international organization. And much like the G7, the SCO will continue to make headlines when leaders gather to propose their agendas for foreign consumption. But without a clear mission or cohesion among its growing bodies, of members, the SCO will, SCO will struggle to produce concrete achievements. When Russian President Putin and Chinese President got together, they agreed to merge the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative under the auspicious of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in 2015. So that's really interesting because the Belt and Road Initiative kind of gets wrapped under this SCO conglomerate, which started as just a few countries, but is quickly growing. And the one Belt Road Initiative is a big thing to keep an eye on. So the Belt and Road Initiative, aka Silk Road, Silk Road Economic Belt, all this stuff is pretty much the same thing. It's just a trade route. That is going to become more important with the trade tariffs that are currently going on and the trade negotiation talks between the US and China. That is going to become more and more important. There seems to be this sort of backdoor conversation happening between China, Russia, without the United States really being involved in that. Now pivot to Mile Unity Foundation, which has the Mile coin. I had no idea this was a cryptocurrency really flying under the radar. It's like a really cheap ripple, like a really cheap version of ripple, like w not enough connections at all. Look, our community size is 5,000 people. Their focus is the unbanked essentially with like so many others, just cross border payments. Okay. And fast, secure, uh, uncensored, blah, 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 cross border trading, foreign direct investments. But here's what I wanted to show you. Look at who their partners are. BRICS International Alliance, which we just saw here. Check this out under related bricks. Here's that. But Global Silk Road Association, Silk Road Chamber of International Commerce. Pretty interesting, right? They seem to have really tapped the vein to this whole Silk Road Belt Road initiative. And I don't know how big this could get. This might be one to actually keep an eye on. It is just now uh, this year being traded on these are smaller exchanges. I actually never use those. They do have a working wallet and they've got uh, apps as well for those wallets. I just thought this was interesting. I completely just randomly found this. I have not dug into the team yet and any of their maybe correlations and interesting uh, footprints there and breadcrumbs there. I've not dug into any of those. If you guys want to go ahead, the, it's just mile.global. I just thought that this was really, really interesting. Uh, four offices so far. That whole thing, that whole SEO was originally related to the SDR and it has to do with the One Belt Road Initiative. All this stuff weaves in together. Um, Jim Rich Richards talks uh, about this quite a bit. The correlation between SEO and SDR, let me see if I can find that. There's a subject that is far off the radar by the mainstream media, independent media, and basically any media in the West that Mr. Richards was somewhat surprised when I asked him about. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization is one of the most important developments of the last 50 years. This plan, which encompasses over 50% of the global population and over 70% of the natural resources on the planet, has been completely overlooked with few exceptions for many years. China and Russia sit on the head of this gigantic organization and the implications for the West are many and far reaching. The monetary infrastructure that is already in place has the capacity to make void all Western world banking, financial, and economic activity. So that's how this stuff kind of all ties in. That's what it was. The uh, infrastructure, the monetary infrastructure that they could kind of weasel and, and navigate, right? And the IMF is not part of the United States at all. And the IMF has this SDR. So that's how those two kind of connect together. And the last piece I want to talk about is what would get, what would get us all to agree to a one world currency? Let's really think about this for a second. Okay, Bretton Woods, the formation of the United Nations, the IMF, the IMDB, the World Bank, and many other things. Uh, quantitative easing came out of this. Gold standard came out of this. What did it? World War II. 
So what was World War II? Essentially, it was just an exhausting, devastating, brutal war. So how do you get 44 nations who speak different languages, pray to different gods, eat different foods, and have completely different domestic laws to agree on one set of rules? World War II did it. Okay, so what would do it today? Well, we have this interesting and coincidental influx of terrorist attacks going on all over the world that's shaping social media laws, censorship laws, freedom of speech laws, freedom of ca- freedom to carry laws, and gun laws all over the world. And those are all ship- shipping, uh, shaping up differently and shifting. And the thing I want to talk about next is, I don't have links for it, but you can look it up yourself, Jared Kushner, who is Donald Trump's right-hand man, and a couple other people in the White House are working on, they've been tirelessly working on this peace bill, international peace bill. So how do you get 44 nations or more than that, 100 nations, all the nations to come together, uh, a peace bill would do it. So what if on the back end, because they're pushing this hard, mark my words, they're going to be bringing this up more and more and more, this peace bill, this international peace treaty. And that's been talked about quite a bit. And there's also some other countries, I believe Israel, Netanyahu is talking about a one world uh, religion. And there's the, a couple of big pushes that are starting to emerge is uh, one world peace, a peace in the world and a one world religion. What goes beautifully with that one world currency. So I'm just not 100% sure on what that's going to be yet. I've had some working theories and I've kind of tested some stuff out, but I'm not, I'm not uh, stuck in any one direction, I guess, at this point. I think there's room for both. There's room for them leveraging a deflationary cryptocurrency. There's room for them like Ripple, like Stellar Lumen or something new that they've been working on behind the scenes. Maybe it's this mile unity or there could be a bunch of stable coins that get released out on a blockchain. Uh, that either exists like Stellar, the IBM news recently would you know suggest something like that could be in the works. Uh, so they would leverage that or a platform that provides everything for them like Cosmos, Atom, could also be leveraged and used for to spawn off tons of stable coins that would at least work with the G20 countries. And then maybe cryptocurrencies play some other role in that, or maybe that is the dual currency deal. And then cryptocurrencies are all left out there to fend for themselves, which that could completely happen. And so maybe it's just coincidental that Ripple has all these big banking connections. Maybe they're used to a degree, but not as big as we might be thinking so. And the elites and all the bankers are involved because they just want to make more money and they just want to have their hand on the pulse of innovation. Maybe that's exactly what's going on. And Ripple does go to a thousand or ten thousand dollars, right? As it would naturally have to behave like that if it got if it got used and uh, adopted, or the supply and demand curve just tipped the other way, and it would start to build value that way. A lot of people ask me at this point, well, wouldn't Bitcoin become redundant at this point? You got to remember what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is a decentralized, deflationary currency that cannot be shut off, and it works again off of supply and demand. So there's essentially a, uh, a finite amount, and that amount is always going down. There's none being burned, but there's some being lost all the time. So people are losing, uh, losing their backups, losing their wallets. And so some is lost all the time. And there's only a finite amount is naturally a deflationary currency because it will rise in value over time because of supply and demand. So I don't see how Bitcoin can ever really be stopped. I don't really think that a lot of the initiatives like Lightning Network, a second layer and stuff like that, I don't think Bitcoin really should be global currency. I don't know. I, I don't see the banks really buying into that or wanting to get a piece of that. Maybe a second layer or a third layer can be created that would get them excited excited about it. They tend to not like volatility. They want stable and secure unless the transactions can happen really, really quick, which is like what Lightning Network now uh, offers. I haven't dug into Lightning Network enough to, to know the ins and outs and to be able to talk about that proficiently. But I do know that it speeds up transactions and it can move millisatoshis, okay? So uh, smaller amounts of money. Uh, that could maybe open up opportunity there for Bitcoin. So I think that the overall um, supply of Bitcoin just makes it less attractive to governments and to um, to operate as a uh, global currency. You look at something like gold, like what stopped them from going to a gold-backed currency besides the fact that they want freedom to be able to print whenever they want and kind of get themselves out of trouble under this uh, Keynesian uh, economic model that they've been operating off of. But I, I just don't see them going for such a limited supply. 21 million, like with Bitcoin, is a pretty limited supply with about three to four million assumed to be lost. We're at like 17 million. And uh, you would have to have a pretty high cost on that for that to go around and be uh, be used, which I don't know, maybe with Lightning Network, that all makes that make sense. I don't know enough about it yet. That's not got my vote and that doesn't really have my attention. I've got my attention on other things that have a lot of banker support and IMF support. And so this is the next one. This is the next breadcrumb in the lineup of uh, everything that I've so far presented for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to dig deeper 
you're into this stuff, then uh, feel free. And uh, of course, with whatever you find, uh, reach out to me and let me know. But that is SDR, the International Monetary Fund's bucket of fiat currencies that uh, they offer. All right, my friends, if you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up. If you found this video through a friend, through a playlist, related search of some sort, take a look around. This is what we talk about. Uh, if you like that and this is intriguing to you, you got value from it, then please subscribe to the channel. Click the bell notification so you get more of our notifications and help us reshare this. That would be beautiful. Help us spread the word and uh, share this with your friends, family, put in your playlists. All that stuff works a lot. And if you've got something to say, love to hear it. Comment down below underneath the video. Be on the lookout. More content dropping soon. Bye.